So the Ordovician ended on something of a depressing note for sure. Complex life had been doing really well for millions of years ever since the Cambrian explosion, and we were starting to see some really interesting ecosystems. At least the marine ones. Hell, by the end of the Ordovician, even the ancestral vertebrates were starting to be passable as true fish. But all that progress nearly came to a screeching halt when the planet went through a bit of a roller coaster of climatic extremes. First, it got cold. Not quite on the same level of another snowball Earth, but still cold enough to be considered an ice age. Then it swung in the opposite direction and got warm and stagnant. Oxygen levels plummeted, and the world's oceans were once again overwhelmed by cyanobacteria. Ah! Ugh. Ah! You were right. These guys are irritating. Ah! Yeah, tell me about it. But they're also tasty. Alright, well, while you eat that, I think it's time that we move forward. As we leave the Ordovician behind, we're left with a world with only around 15% of the biodiversity it once had. Life was going to have to take some time to recover from the first major bottleneck since things became more complex than this. And that's what it seems like was happening during the roughly 25 million years that followed in the Silurian period. A comparatively short time in geologic terms, but definitely a very significant one where the ancestors of everything alive today start to bounce back. In the wake of so much devastation, the warm climate that caused the glaciers to retreat to the south polar region of Gondwana continued to get even warmer, and this is how it would remain for the duration of this entire period. The thing that we tend to forget about climate change is that it's a constant factor in the story of life on Earth. Global warming, as well as global cooling, can have equally devastating effects, because it's a shift from what the current organisms living at the time are adapted to. Anytime that you see long periods of time where the climate either remains the same or continues intensifying in the same direction, you will see animals adapt to be more and more specialized to those conditions. So despite the fact that the warming climate at the end of the Ordovician was one of the factors that led to a mass extinction, the animals that did survive did so because they were adaptable generalists who were able to make a living in the new, hot, lower oxygen world. And as sea levels began to rise, rivers and lakes would inundate the coastal areas of the supercontinent Gondwana, as well as the newly forming Euramerica in the north. And this would become the perfect home for some larger life forms. During the previous period, I spoke about how a few different species of plants were able to colonize the land, but they remained pretty small and simple. This would all change around 425 million years ago, when the plants finally gained vascular tissues. This was the first great leap forward in plant evolution. It allowed them to have a more stable structure and grow to greater sizes, as well as distribute water and nutrients throughout the plant. They were now capable of reaching up to the sky to access more of the sun's energy. And along the streams and rivers of Silurian, Gondwana, and Euroamerica, these early plants spread out even farther than their ancestors. Species like Cooksonia were some of the first to pioneer this new strategy, forming what could arguably be called one of the first examples of a forest biome. But they wouldn't be the tallest organisms in these forests. That honor instead would go to an entirely different kingdom of organisms. Fungi. Yes, the very first forests on Earth were made up of giant tree trunk-like fungus called Prototaxtides. Now technically, Fungus had been expanding onto land ever since the Ordovician alongside the plants, but by about 420 million years ago, they had become massive 8 meter tall trees, making them the largest organisms on Earth up to that point. This was the first time there was a really well-established terrestrial ecosystem, fueled by the greenhouse climate and constant rain. There was just one thing missing, but that wouldn't be for long. As life on land was finally getting its proper start in the towering fungal forests, life in the ocean was on the slow road to recovery. As far as we know, the large nautiloid predators like Orthoceras were some of the hardest hit by the Ordovician extinction. Some species of this group did survive, like Cephuceras, but they appear to have been less dominant going forward. And this left the niche of top predator open once again. 
And now with the expansion of new types of corals and crannoids exploding in diversity, new marine ecosystems were beginning to open up. Something a little more similar to the coral reefs that we would know today. And for the very first time, the chordates were finally ready to fight for the role of apex predator. The thing is, we needed something to be able, you know, eat something besides goo. As well as a hard skeleton. The thing that would actually give us the name vertebrates. And you know what that means. This should be good. It was around this time that these early true fish started to branch into several different forms. It all started with the evolution of movable jaws. And once that happened, vertebrates were finally able to take advantage of all the different food sources that had previously only been available to arthropods and cephalopods. The jawed fish split into three distinct groups. The cartilaginous fish, whose skeletons were made of a more flexible cartilage. The bony fish, with the skeletons made of bone. And the armored fish, which took a strategy from the arthropods and had a partly external bony skeleton, which helped with defense. And then from there, the bony fish would split into the ray-finned fish and the lobe-finned fish. It was really an age of fish diversification. And this is when my new form, Goyo oirinos, first appeared the earliest lobe fin fish we currently know. What's special about these fish in particular is the fact that the fins are actually mounted to the pectoral and pelvic girdles. This allows for greater range of motion and possibly even the ability to bear weight on them. The seas were starting to fill with life once again. But the thing is, most of the fish still remained pretty small, Goyo just measuring around 30 centimeters long. But that was because despite our explosive variety that came in about 10 million years, we were not alone. In fact, the fish were still far from the dominant group during the Silurian. Ah, oh, crap. Even with teeth like this, we still haven't taken over? Well, there was one, but it wasn't Andreolepis. Sorry. The only one that even came close was the monster fish Megamastix, a lobe fin fish that grew to a meter long, making it the largest vertebrate on Earth during this time. You're like a third of that size. Plus, there's still another group of animals that I still need to cover from the Silurian, another survivor from the Ordovician extinction that would become the ruler of these warm, shallow seas. It's more big bugs, isn't it? Oh yes. Ever since the Cambrian, the arthropods have been major competitors for dominance in the world's oceans. In tier zoo terms, they were top builds in the game. The first huge successes for them came in the form of trilobites and radiodonts. But there were many other groups that branched off along the way. The trilobites were still going strong and even bouncing back during the Silurian. However, the radiodonts were starting to run out of steam at this point. And as the Ordovician gave way to the Silurian, a new group of arthropods started to take that top predator role, the Eurypterids. We already talked about those first species like Pentacopterus and how they were a threat to the early vertebrates during the Ordovician. But the thing is, they had a lot of competition from the large cephalopods, so they struggled to get out of the role of bottom feeders. And although the carrot krakens weren't entirely gone, they were definitely less abundant than they used to be. And just like we see time and again, there will always be something waiting to take advantage of open niches. It was finally the sea scorpions time. And they would split into two different body plans and survival strategies. The Stylonuriesque sea scorpions, which remained smaller and kept to the ocean floor, scavenging on whatever they could. And the Eurypterina sea scorpions, who took a more active hunting approach. They had paddle-like arms that allowed them to swim through open water, which gave them the edge they needed to become the kings of the Panthalassic Seas. This one group evolved into several different species, but by a wide margin, the most common was Eurypterus, which makes up up to 95% of the sea scorpion fossils found from this time. I even own one. 
Now, Eurypterus was a modestly sized little horror at between 13 and 60 centimeters long. But one genus of sea scorpions that stood out among the rest was the monstrous Pterygotus. These guys were the apex predators of the Silurian. They grew to nearly three meters long and had grasping claws that actually make them look more like the true scorpions that they share their name with. It's actually believed that these arthropod predators evolved in response to the explosion in fish diversity that was going on across the globe. It appeared to almost be an evolutionary arms race between the two groups. And with things like Terry Gotis, Mega Mastix, and a handful of remaining squid around, the oceans were getting pretty scary again. If you were small, it was beneficial for you to try to avoid these sea monsters. And the best way to do that would be to enter the New Frontier, a world where the only giant organisms was giant mushrooms. That's where the future is. The end of the Silurian was not nearly as devastating as the end of most periods in Earth's history. There were a few notable things that happened, though. The climate that had held on for 25 million years was about to go from warm to hot, and as a result, now there was no ice at all at the poles. And now, tectonic activity was starting to ramp up. The last pieces of Euro-America were starting to come together as Siberia pushed into the North American plate, and this formed a new giant mountain range. But currently, there was nothing that could live there. All the plants and fungus that currently lived on land still had to stick close to the water, leaving the interior of both supercontinents a massive desert. But it's in this moment that our world is the most alive that it has been so far. And among the giant mushrooms and tiny plants, there is a chance that you might actually see movement for the very first time. Because to survive the onslaught of the fish and sea scorpions competing beneath the waves, a few groups of small arthropods have managed to make the transition into living at least part of the time on land. It probably started small, with some different kinds of Eurypterids crawling up onto land to lay their eggs far away from everything else, but by the time we get to the end of the Silurian, we see the first signs of fully terrestrial animals. The first pioneers being millipedes and possibly even the true arachnid cousins of the sea scorpions. For the moment at least, it was a bug's world. However, in the seas, the competition between vertebrates and arthropods was about to intensify. Going forward, things are going to get a lot more interesting. In my opinion, at least. And actually, the next three periods were some of the most requested times for me to cover even before I started to do these deep dives into the history of the Earth. And considering how little publicity the Paleozoic gets, and how interesting life gets during this time, I can see why. But for now, I must leave you on this beautiful world of giant mushroom trees, scorpions the size of crocodiles, and Tim Tim looking like a creature cooked up by Jim Henson on cough syrup. Hey! Have a good one, everybody.